reject. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to our talk. We're, we're going to talk about today um, an exper exper experimental performance experience. Um, one that involves not only the performer on stage, but also you as an actively participating ad hoc performers as well. So a little bit about us first. Um, I'm Jocelyn. I'm a classical pianist and composer. And here is my collaborator. Uh, I'm Drew, Drew Peterson. I'm a software engineer, JavaScript engineer at Spotify. All right, so I was really excited about Miles' talk because music is really an you know, empathic activity between the audience and the performer. And today we're going to do this, extend this, by making your mobile phones into makeshift instruments. All right, so a little bit about the background. Uh, I'm running a year-long project called Synesthesia Playground, a project that is interdisciplinary and collaborative, uh, involving myself, four other composers, a visual artist, and Drew here, our star software developer. Uh, this project is uh, commissioning five multimedia works for piano, uh, which I'll take on tour next year. The goal of this project is to make the classical music experience accessible, dare I say transform the classical music experience even, to something that is interactive, fun, relatable, and appealing to all audiences with mobile phones, and that's everybody, basically. So, what is this uh, word here, this long word, synesthesia? Our five senses, even though we think of them as separate, turns out not to be so distinct. When we hear sounds, we often think of space, like high and low sounds. Uh, we think of colors, like bright or dull, or temperature, like warm and icy. So some people feel this intermixing of the senses more acutely than others, and this neurological phenomenon is called synesthesia. So for instance, uh, synesthetes, people with synesthesia, might see sounds very vividly, see colors associated with specific harmonies or pitches and so on, or have some kind of tactile experience when they see colors or hear sounds. So synesthesia inspires an altogether new way of listening to music through all the senses of our bodies. So the goal of synesthesia playground is to get at this bodily experience, appealing to sound through other senses. Now, throughout Western historical thought, music has been debated as a pure, abstract, idealized form of art. However, you cannot only listen to music in your mind. The split between mind and body is just an artificial divide that takes away from the fullness of this bodily, visceral experience. In fact, the 20th century phenomenologist, uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, here, goes even a step further and asserts that every knowledge that we have, every experience we have in this world, is first and foremost through our body. No thought, no emotion is ever away from the bodily knowledge that you have acquired throughout years of living. So Synesthesia Playground aims to celebrate this bodily experience, bringing music, music from the abstract and the heady uh, to this very basic full human experience. All right, so that's the context of Synesthesia Playground, this year-long project. The piece we're discussing today is one of the five commissioned works. While the other works deal with the bodily experience of an individual, this piece we're talking about today involves the collective experience of interconnected communal bodies. Now, music has always been something that humans have done collectively as a form of cultural sharing. It's practiced as a type of communal 
bonding since the beginnings of the ages, whether it be in ceremonies, in churches, in late night jam sessions, and so on. For this piece, our vision is this type of communal music making. We want to create a collective structured improvisation involving a flexible amount of people with one guiding improviser, me, at the front. We aim to transform the classical piano concert into a collaborative bonding musical experience with instruments relevant to the 21st century, our mobile phones. So we decided to use mobile gestural technologies, both in terms of screen and uh, accelerometer detected gestures, because it appeals immediately to the bodily sense of touch and of movement. Now, what could a particular gesture sound like? Like a shake, or a slash, or a slow scratch? <laughs> what could a certain touch, like tickling or tapping, sound like? Now, in addition, the Kinect is going to be used to detect the pianist's movements. The Kinect augments the piano by associating gestures in the air with sounds. So, for instance, one of the gestures I use is this very dramatic arm gesture, and it's associated with a drastic change in the pace of the music. All right, so I'm the pianist at the front, and the audience somehow interacts with me and you know, amongst themselves as well. So now we've got a framework, let's talk a little bit about the content of the piece. There's a, the setup we have here actually opens up a lot of opportunities as well as questions. Now, what is the relationship between the pianist and the audience? What's the relationship between the audience members um, from one to the other? A more practical question is, um, how do I juggle interactivity with kind of performative satisfaction or performative sportsmanship? Now, more philosophically, is the issue of game versus performance. So game is about you know, involvement, um, where everyone's participating, doing stuff. And performance involves kind of spectatorship. So is it still a performance if everyone is a player and there are no spectators? Or are the game players also spectating? So on this spectrum, how much of the piece is actually a performance and how much of it is a game? So with this new kind of performance slash game kind of system in place, I've decided to exploit this very interactive environment by coming up with a piece about social dynamics, psychology, and social behavior. So think of a room of people at a party, like Renoir's boat party. How do people relate to each other? How do people act in response to what they hear? Do you chime in when people talk? Or do you feel in silences when people don't talk? In some situations, people choose to talk over one another, while some people just you know, choose to reflect back or imitate what they hear. Now, self-consciousness is something we are all familiar with at a party. What do people do in response to how conscious of, uh, of themselves? Uh, and in the presence of an influential individual, is there a possibility of just mindless echoing or emulation? So the piece that I've wrote, or I've written, heightens this bodily experience of these social interactions. How does it feel to be hesitant and uncertain, anxious, self-conscious uh, self or confident? So I've turned these kind of social behaviors um, and consciousness into sound, into a piece of music. All right, so back to the concert hall. Now, we have a room full of people, each with their phones. So I've split up the audience into four quadrants. Now, for each quadrant, uh, or group, green, red, blue, and yellow, I devised game-like rules for gesturing with the phones. These rules explore how people act and listen to each other in different social dynamics. So here is an example of one of them. 
So in this one, the audience is asked to be hyper aware of their own bodies, uh, like be very aware of you know, swallowing your saliva. Um, so which is, a, which is a bodily experience of being self-conscious, being hyper aware of what you're doing, which usually is automatic. So these rules change as the piece is played. As the soundscape changes, the audience is also given different rules to adapt to the environment. All right, enough talking. So let's hear some excerpts of the preview performance we had last week um, at Spectrum NYC, an experimental music venue. All right. So the piece is divided into three sections. So this is the first section, which you're hearing now. So this section is called metal. You, see, you hear a lot of metallic sounds inside the piano stuff. You can see it's very dark, but some, some of the people are raising their phones to emit sounds from the, the mobile phones. The rules of the, the mobile phones that you that they have. Alright, so Alright, so this is section two. That was the connect gesture. Um, to go into section two. Section two is called underwater. And uh, the audience is compelled to be self-conscious or hyper-aware of themselves following the rules on their phones. All right. So this is another example. So this is um, the gesture going from the underwater section to section three. So that's the content and the kind of philosophy behind the piece, but how did we do it? Yes, so let's find out. Uh, the answer, in case you're wondering, is just a lot of JavaScript. Just JavaScript all over the place. Um, here's the setup. You saw a little excerpts of it before. Um, I'm going to be moving pretty quickly because there's a live demo, so forgive me if I'm speeding. But this is actually my brother and Jocelyn at the piano. Up at the top, in the middle, there's a little, like, eye-looking thing, like Curiosity Rover, yeah, that's the Kinect looking at Jocelyn and, and my brother's on the computer controlling the Kinect. Um, so there were a few challenges with this thing and it's a challenge to get any sort of phones to kind of coordinate this, you know, this many phones. We had about 30 people, which was a great turnout. We're going to have even more today, so hopefully it works. We'll see what happens. But uh, I started writing my own thing and then turns out, oh, someone already wrote a thing that does this exactly. Uh, it's a server called Rhizome and you should all check it out. It's amazing. It's basically just an automatic messaging service with supports for WebSockets and OSC, uh, which is a sound protocol. Um, it does things like reconnect automatically and also just does some pub sub stuff. So here's how like a typical real-time server app might work. Um, you've got the client, like a phone and some server. And the client says like, hey, what's going on? The server's like, here's what's going on, sends it back. And then also is like sending back updates to the client because the server knows everything about um, the state. And in this case, the server would know everything about the performance. And that kind of looks like this topologically. Um, in the, what we did for this performance is used instead a uh, distributed messaging server app, which of course still has a centralized server, still has the Rhizome central server. But certain clients are elevated to a super client status. And that's actually where all of the state and logic of the app are. So a client might tell the server, hey, tell me about world events. The server says, sure, I'll do that when they come in. And then a super client, such as the computer that I was controlling during the performance, uh, which has all the state and logic and is maybe receiving events from the Kinect, sends a message to the central server saying, hey, everyone, there's a new world event, and then the server distributes it to everyone. What this means is that the central server is really just routing messages and, and doesn't have any logic built into it. And it looks kind of like this. Uh, in our performance, we had a few different super clients, the conductor and the performer. 
Um, and we also had other special clients, like the laptop controlling the Kinect. Um, so the Kinect would send a signal to the central server, which routes it to the conductor, because it knows um, the conductor has said, I want to know about Kinect events. The conductor goes, hey, cool, this is, like a, this is like a world event thing I should do. So it sends out a new event, and that gets sent out to all the clients. So just very, fairly standard pub sub. And this is not like a crazy architecture, but it took me a while to figure out. And that's why I'm sharing it with you, because I'm like, oh, that's how you do this. Um, it's nothing, it's nothing that crazy. And you might be thinking, like, hey, the conductor always outputs state to the client in one direction. And you know, one direction, state, and you just like you have to mention React the second you talk about one direction and state. Um, and I just wanted to mention it because I, I did use it for the views, and you're, you're all going to see it in a little bit. Um, it worked really well to go from the state coming in to each audience client, statelessly render, and then each client is basically just a terminal that uh, doesn't know anything but its own potential. It knows what it can render. It doesn't know when it needs to render or how, just that it can. I also use these tools, and I'm just going to keep going because you know, I'm sure you all have used these before. Next challenge, uh, just physical challenge, was networking, um, aka how many clients can connect to my Airport Express, or sorry, Extreme, this guy right down here. The answer is 50. You can search high and wide the internet, and you will come up with 50. It's hard-coded. So if you want more, you need to uh, do your own Wi-Fi setup. And the author of the Rhizome server has actually written a blog post about how to do this. And it basically involves custom APs, uh, separate router, separate switch, and hooking it all up and carrying it all to the venue. Short answer. Um, for us, we were expecting no more than 50, luckily. So the airport extreme yeah, brought it home. Uh, the next challenge we faced was something I'm calling audience engineering. You might consider it uh, user experience or user engineering or something. This, is a, this was a complex piece to get people to buy into. For example, they had to connect to a specific Wi-Fi access point, type in a password, visit a web page all on their phone, and check that the audio works, and check that they have accelerometers working, and all these things. So how did we do this? Well, one thing we did was we just printed out physical cards that had the Wi-Fi information on them. And it was still troublesome for people. People still had trouble. But it worked out better. The password's there because you, know, you have to have a password when uh, in New York, because otherwise people will try to steal your free internet. And even though it wasn't connected to the internet, it would have taken up one of those 50 slots. And last but not least, people, well, it's really hard to type an IP address on a phone, let alone a, or on a desktop, let alone a phone. So I had them type in playground.go, and I did that by using my own uh, DNS server. Not my own, I didn't write it, I just started it up. Um, it's super simple, I had every single thing, any th query that people asked, going to um, pointing at my server. So even Google.com would have pointed at my server. All their mail and stuff would have gone to my server. So check this out if you're ever doing some kind of like custom art piece within an installation and you want people to connect to it. It's way easier than typing in an IP address. Next challenge, the Connect, the Connect 2. How many of you have used a Connect? How many of you have programmed for a Connect? Wow, awesome. So you know that um, you know, it's really cool, it's super powerful. But for me, this boiled down to, do I really have to use Windows? Because uh, I'm a Mac, I'm, I'm primarily on a Mac, and I knew that carrying laptops around would be pretty difficult. And the Windows, Windows is like, you know, do you want to program your own body appendage and figure tracking? And I said, yeah, that sounds like a ton of fun. Do you want to do that, uh, you know, what others have spent a PhD program doing in two weeks? And I said, OK, fine, Windows, you win. I'll use, I'll use you. And in this case, it was actually my brother who did the, uh, most of the Kinect. This is him testing out front and back detection. You can see it knows which hand is which, even though he spins. This is his contact information there, if you're curious. Um, and this is the Connect. You can see it, it tracking Jocelyn. I just wanted to show it to you. It's way at the bottom there, but it's kind of cool. So you'll see her do the, the gesture. And it's actually very accurate. And that triggered the section, uh, the next part of the, the piece of the audio. Um, OK. <laughs> By the way, shaking your phone, doing gestures, you'd think these are solved. They're not. Um, they're totally not. They're really hard. There's all these techniques for doing it. Um, I studied a few of them. I didn't have a time to look into all of them. But I wanted to walk through at least one, which is called dynamic time warping. Um, just want to mention it, really, because I want to make sure we have time for more stuff. But basically, you take a sliding window of events, you take a pattern, and then you try to match the events to your pattern. 
and it tries to compensate for the patterns not perfectly matching. Uh, which is cool, this is a cool paper, you can read about it, explains it pretty well. However, I did it totally wrong, and it just ended up working by lucky, by lucky chance, really. Um, so there was that, and in addition, one other technique for gestures that I used was uh, just like taking the magnitude of the vector of the events as they're coming in and saying, if they are all greater than 1.8, then do it. It's a magic number. It's just totally magical, and it kind of works, um, but I would love it to be better. Unfortunately, slow time. And finally, uh, one, one thing that was a challenge uh, with the gestures was reality versus uh, the intent of the piece, the intent of the composer, and the intent of the, the, you know, the, the idea of the music. Some of these gestures were really hard to do, so instead of doing them, we just changed the gesture, um, which was a compromise that I was willing to make, maybe not Jocelyn as much, but uh, you know, we kind of were up against a wall with some things. So, now that we are, now that you've gotten through that tech stuff, um, just because I thought you might be curious, let's do something where <laughs> you're never supposed to do, which is a live demo. So I'd love it if everyone could try this out. Um, we're going to try a performance of this thing right here. Um, so everyone, pull out your phones. It has to be a phone. It can't be a laptop. It can be an iPad or a tablet. Visit this IP address. And hopefully, Hopefully this works and the Wi-Fi holds. Make sure you're on the, uh, the cat pictures here, Wi-Fi. If you get a begin button, go ahead and tap it. I'm going to escape out of this for a moment just so I can make sure that things are fluxing over here. Yeah, we've got people connecting, so that's good. OK, that's great. Here's the IP address again. Uh, there we go. And when we've got like a significant amount of people who are pressing that button and hearing square waves, I want to hear your square waves. Come on. <laughs> um, hopefully it works. There's one. Yes. By the way, I am asking you to turn on your phone volume. So it's OK if it rings. It's OK if it, bleep, 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 you know, it's going to. Uh, and that's totally fine. It's very slow, I'm sure. Uh, so much JavaScript. <laughs> is it coming? Is it like pausing for some people? I, I can hear. Nice, nice. It's kind of there, sort of. OK. Let's wait like two minutes and see if we can get everyone kind of connected. Also, it shows the grid there, and the grid is somewhat arbitrary, but it's basically, you know, the front is, is us, so the top of your phone is us. Um, yeah. Is anyone having, like, just crazy, crazy issues? I feel like we're kind of good here. Oh, really? It won't stop playing? Okay. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Well, I do love the sound of square waves, frankly, <laughs> especially in the morning or the afternoon. Where are we? All oh, right, Berlin. <laughs> All right. Cool. I feel like maybe we're yeah. maybe we're okay. Yeah. Uh, so obviously, this uh, the demo is gonna not have a piano. Steinway didn't sponsor my talk, so. Um, so it's going to be kind of like a modified <laughs> demo where I'm not going to be really that much involved. So you guys are kind of like an autonomous system, just doing your own improvising for most of the time. And let, let's just see something here. Question. Oh, question. Yes. Where is there? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. The, uh, the Wi-Fi of the convention. Cat pictures here. Cat pictures here. Get your cat pictures. Actually, Miles had great ones. We had none. Yeah. We're failing you all. <laughs> all right. I think my socket did die. Oh, boy. Wow, it died. All right, well, we'll just try it again. 
This is how you test scale, by the way, in production. It's actually, this, I wanted to talk about this, but it's a very difficult thing to test uh, to get this many phones. Um, give it a minute. Give it a minute. Oh, I should have hit the, wrong, the other button. All right, let's see here. Okay. There we go. Cool, we have 64 people connected or so. Maybe some more. Cool. All right, should we, we just, just try it? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's just try it. We're running out of time. I don't want to go over too much here. So, uh, what? Oh, no. I'm still getting requests, sort of. Yeah, they're coming in. Mm. I mean, my, we'll see what my, how my laptop can handle it, but... All right. Let's just so give let's, it a shot. Let's try it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh oh. Uh-oh. Did it die again? <laughs> no. Did the Wi-Fi actually die? <laughs> oh, no. Did it, did it really die? I think it really died. <laughs> Because my phone doesn't have Wi-Fi anymore. All right, we'll do it from the we'll do it from the computer here. All right. All right, here we go. So, uh, yeah, this is hang on a sec, hang on a sec. I know it's not it doesn't work that right. There we go. Try that. Did it click? Oh shit! Does it not? It's a touch UI. It doesn't have click events. It has tap events. <laughs> Hang on a sec. <laughs> There's a way to do this. This is, I use Firefox every day, just so you know. Just not in responsive mode. Device, there we go, thank you. Can be a six. Yes, you ready? Yep. Just, okay. <laughs> All right, just follow, hopefully it follows along. Hopefully your phones are synced.
it. All right. <laughs> cool. All right, we gotta go. Almost. Uh, okay, so I think we're like totally out of time. Sorry for going over. I hope it was okay. <laughs> Do you want to say anything else? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, so everyone's a rock star now. So. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah. Reject.